Good evening, everybody. We want to thank you all for joining us. We do realize that we are a few minutes away. That was beyond our control, but we appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, and so we are going to start our program now, and um, I'm going to welcome up our first presenter. everyone. My name is Dominique Gibbs. Um, I'm a student at Coppin State University, currently in the social work program. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to all of our visitors. Um, uh, guest speakers aren't here yet, but welcome to them. Um, to be a social worker is to be an educator, an advocate, and sometimes a... Oh, mm, mm, to be a social worker is to be an advocate, an educator, and sometimes just the... Oh, I, mm, you're good. You got it. <clears throat> to be a social worker is to be an advocate, an educator, and sometimes a listening ear to someone in need. To social workers of Baltimore City who are fighting towards change and effective outcomes, I would like to say thank you and happy social work month. To the social workers of Coppin State University, thank you. I appreciate you and happy social work month. <clears throat> The time is now for us to converse with one another about how our neighborhoods are still being redlined and suffering from food insecurities, lack of healthcare resources, and digital divide, and environmental necessities. Even though the dollar housing bill is in gridlock, what if right now we can talk about how current homeowners are living next to abandoned, dilapidated houses? Or we can talk about how we can create classes for millennials so that they can learn how to own and buy a home. <clears throat> what if right now we can strategize and come together and talk about how we can pair with internet companies to figure out how we can meet students' virtual needs? <clears throat> Today at Coppin, we have Council President Nick Mosby and Councilman Z. Cohen who will be speaking with us today. Maybe we can strategize and figure out some ways to solve some issues in Baltimore and help Baltimore heal. <clears throat> Next up is Tarina Williams and Charisma Thomas, who will be introducing our guest today. Thank you so much, Dominique. Um, actually, so the next voice you're going to hear is from our esteemed chair, Dr. Gilliam, um, and then you will hear from um, Charisma and, oh, I'm sorry, the next voice you'll hear is Dr. Jenkins, our university president, followed by Dr. Gilliam, and then our um, two scholars will introduce our panelists. All right, guys. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll give the <laughs> so listen, um, let me first welcome everybody and uh, thank you all for coming out. Thank you for being here. Um, it's always important, I think, a great opportunity when you have leadership who shows up and who walks the walk and talks the talk. And since I've gotten here and the conversations that we've had, uh, you are truly an you know, individual who, who does that. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Excellent job. Yes. Right. Yes. This is all with leadership yes. and training. Yes. yes. tell you, Coppin family, that when it comes to being that hope and being leadership and being those, those change agents, that is what Coppin is about. That is in our DNA. <clears throat> that is who we've been since 1900. And that's who we're going to continue to be, is that we want to make sure that we do everything we can to make our community, West Baltimore, Baltimore, the state of Maryland, and this region better. And we have the ability and the skill sets and the emotional intelligence to do that. And you all, as our students, our greatest product, are gonna help drive that narrative and lead that charge. Our faculty, who are the experts, will continue to shape and mold you. 
our elected officials are going to partner with you. And so everything that we do is inextricably linked. Not one person walks alone, does it alone, and gets to the end by themselves. That's not the way it works. So with the West North Avenue Authority that we will be overseeing here at COP, it's going to play a significant role in our reimagining the West North Avenue corridor. It's going to allow us to look at home ownership and look at entrepreneurship and look at those things that the individuals in our community deserve and should have a right to, just like everybody else, right? And so that they're not living next to dilapidated homes. And we are going to work to do things to bring down crime and increase the actual high school graduation rate and the college going rate and the quality of life, right? And you say, that's a lot. Well, that's why we're in this business. That's why you're going into social work because you are about change and changing the quality of people's lives. Today, I hope that the conversation lends itself as I'm sure that it will to talking about some of these strategies and solutions and just getting us to think either more critically or in a way that we may not have thought about previously, right? Not one of us have all the answers. Together, we are powerful. We are. There is nothing we cannot accomplish if we work together. Put aside our differences, focus on the bigger picture. The bigger picture, students, it's not even you. Because you have beat so many odds. You are on your trajectory. It's about those who are coming behind you, right? Who need the same hope and the same mentoring and the same support and the same guidance and pathways that you will afford. So everything that you do moving forward is about paying it back, right? So I don't ever want you to lose sight of that. Whether you stay in social work, whether you go into politics, whether you open up your your own company, right? Whatever it may be, always know that you're doing it for a bigger cause than yourself. Because life is about making change for the environment around you. And that's what I always want us to challenge and make sure that we never lose sight of. Today is gonna to be a great conversation. And I want to challenge you all to keep this conversation moving even after today is over. Take it back to every corner you return to. Challenge your friends. Challenge your space. And as I always say, Eagles, always make every environment you enter better than when you found it. All right? Dr. Buckley, thank you for the opportunity. I greatly appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. And now we will hear from the esteemed <laughs> Dean Beverly O'Brien. <laughs> if, if you look close, you'll, you'll, you'll see she's actually levitating up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, what an honor to be introduced by the president on Women's Day. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. And welcome, everyone, and to everyone on our looking at how many people are on the screen. This is indeed wonderful. And um, I, I have to say on, on the, the tail end of the president's remarks about what you're learning in social work and where you're going. For those of you who happen to have been on our professional conversation series today, and uh, Cy Wainwright spoke last week, who's a graduate from the social work department. And she did exactly what Dr. Jenkins just talked about was in our series is about life after COVID. What do you do with your degree afterwards? And Cy, who has always been a very straightforward speaker, hasn't changed one bit. She is still <laughs> totally straightforward. But she talked about all the skill sets you have learned, and whether you're in social work or politics, this is where today this conversation is about Baltimore City and the state of Baltimore and how much you have to give back to it. And um, the skill sets that you're learning are are just so applicable to so many other settings. And I hope that you will 
continue to do that. And whether you set or reset or reset three or four or five times, you keep doing that because that's what we all do in order to, to advance ourselves. And so um, I'm very pleased that we're having this conversation. So nice to see you it's again this again. Uh, twice in, uh, no, in four days, three days. So, but uh, thank you so much for all of you for attending. Thank you, so Department of Social Work, our always, always proactive department. Continue to do what you're doing. And these phenomenal students are, are where our future lies. And we appreciate what you're doing and what you're learning. Keep having those entrepreneurial thoughts because um, that's what's going to keep you moving ahead. And you have so much to contribute to whatever space it is that you land. And understand that the space in which you land doesn't have to be the final space. You have skills that can go on and on and on because part of your growing process is understanding that you have much to contribute to multiple places. And you're always a Kodak moment. I remember that too. So go for it, young, young eagles. Fly, fly, fly. to be here and to be able to have an opportunity. We want to thank the guests for coming, to the president, to Dean O'Brien, to the council members of the city of Baltimore for giving our students the opportunity to put into practice what we're trying to teach them in class, that their voices matter. Dominique, even when your voice cracks, your voice still matters. Yeah. And so we want them to be able to have opportunities to know. I teach policy, if you see my shirt today, it says policy is my love language, because it is. Uh, Dr. Buckley knows I call her crying all the time because she gets to have all the fun with the policy class this semester. Um, and so I'm very excited about this opportunity for students to actually have an opportunity to experience what it is that they're learning in class. That council member Zeke Cohen is a real person, even though they have been practicing how to say his title and how to say his name, that he is a real person uh, who had a real job in real life before he became a council member who was actually accessible. And so that is something that we want students to be able to experience. And so thank you for this uh, opportunity. I know Charisma and Tarina have been practicing, so now is your big moment. <laughs> summit last week. Uh, Councilman Cohen, we sincerely want to thank you so much for giving Coppice State University and the Social Work Department the opportunity to participate in such an amazing transformative event. Students got the opportunity to not only serve, but also to meet so many great community members that it really is about helping our community to heal and what is it that we can do directly to not only heal ourselves, but also help the community to heal. It's been a three year process and it is still growing and evolving and evolving. I really do want to encourage everyone in the community, if you care about Baltimore, if you're interested in the issues that are going on in Baltimore, to go online, to look up Hill and City Baltimore and find out what the movement is about. There's little ways that you can get involved. It goes on all year long. It's not, it doesn't start and end. Uh, last week it is an ongoing event. Our students have had opportunities to serve in many different ways. We have alumni who continue to serve. Yes. So I really do want to encourage everybody <clears throat> to not only sit at the news and talk about what is going on, but do what we try to teach our students to do, which is actually get involved. So without further ado, Trina, you're ready. Charisma, you're ready. All right. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, Catherine, faculty, students, and guests. My name is Tarina Williams, and I am a proud copy state socialist. Yes. yes. It is my honor this afternoon to um, Council President Nadine Lofi. He is in route, but I will continue. <clears throat> um, as a husband, father, 
leader, mentor, professional and public servant. City Council President Nick Mosby has never forgotten his humble beginnings and will never turn a blind eye to his to the people of his city and community. <clears throat> As a native son of Baltimore City, Mr. Mosby graduated from Baltimore Polytechnic Institute and went on to study electrical engineering at Tuskegee University. Upon receiving an engineering degree, Mr. Mosby returned home. And in 2011, Mr. Mosby ran for city council and as councilman, created and ran a mentoring program for juveniles waiting trial as adults. <clears throat> he also passed legislation banning the requirement of criminal records on job applications, as well as introduced and passed legislation stopping liquor stores from selling merchandise to minors. In 2015, throughout the Baltimore City unrest, Mr. Mosby argued that the rioting was the result of years of, of, years of neglect of Baltimore's youth, lack of employment opportunities, and poverty that led people to fend for themselves in unproductive ways. Mr. Mosby <clears throat> took his fight from Baltimore City Hall to the Maryland State House in 2017, where he was appointed to the House of Delegates in the Maryland General Assembly. As a state delegate, Mr. Mosby successfully passed legislation to allocate millions of dollars in financial aid for GED recipients, enacted fair hiring laws for formerly incarcerated citizens, ended the draconian practice of taking property based on late water bills, and strengthened Maryland's historically black colleges and universities by creating tax credits to increase endowment. Mr. Mosby successfully won election in 2018 to the House of Delegates, where he served as a member of the Ways and Means Committee and chair of the Election Law sub Subcommittee. As council president, <clears throat> Mr. Mosby looks forward to continuing to advocate for Baltimore City residents and pass meaningful legislation that will improve the lives of our residents. He is a proud member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated and he worship, worships at New Psalmist Baptist Church of Baltimore. Yeah. Thank you, Hello, all. Uh, my name is Charisma Thomas. And I'm a social work student here at Coppin. I am a junior. Um, today, I'm thrilled to introduce um, John Hopkins University alumni, Master of Public Policy, City Councilman of the First District, Mr. C. Cohen. Sure. Um, I just saw Council President um, pull up. Um, he's he's coming in. Yes. Okay. So. Maybe Zika tell us a little bit about your I was just about to say, yeah, um, this is your opportunity to <laughs> you get a few extra moments. So um, maybe give us a little bit more about your, your background. Sure. Um, so first off, really appreciate you all having us here today. Um, President, Dean, um, Dr. Gilliam, Dr. Buckley, uh, students, it is really an honor to get to be with you all. Um, we have, for the last three years, except for one year when we were virtual, come here, as you know, to do our Healing City Summit Community Day. And I gotta say, I went to both Goucher and Hopkins, but I consider myself a Coppin, Coppin guy at heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, my background's in teaching. This is City Council President Nick Mosby. Good. Okay, so before you get settled and before you finish, I unfortunately have to go, but I would love to get a picture of you all and meet Dr. Buckley and Dr. Uh, Gilbert if you would. Okay. <laughs> 
So we're going to go ahead and start with the questions. All right. Council President Logan, when you were running for the office of council president, your priority policy areas were safe streets, better schools, workforce, and public health. Now that you have been in the office for one year, what is different? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I wouldn't say anything is different. Um, and I would say if I ran for council president 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, those same things would probably be my same priority. I think there's a systemic issue that kind of sit at the core of the issues and the functionality associated with our city. I think that it's those policy decisions that sit at the core of the bigotry and the systemic racism that plagued our city that we see the byproducts of today. Uh, and I and, and I think that, again, the residual effects that we see of the crime and the grime and the blight when we turn on the news or open the newspaper is from all of those different reasons. So uh, I think that, you know, we're faced as leaders with, are we going to really tackle it? Are we going to go outside of the box and do unconventional things? Or are we going to continue to double down on the same failed policies and approaches that we've taken in the past? And um, so I would say I would take the same, the same exact approach, uh, that being my core competency, as it relates to trying to be um, the best council president for the city of Baltimore as possible. Thank you. So city Councilman Cohen, the profession of social work has identified 12 grand challenges, a call to action to address social issues and policy concerns. Several of the issues align with your policies, namely the digital divide. Among the many things we learned from COVID-19, we, we learned that internet access is a matter of urgency and equity. The digital divide is yet another example of Baltimore's access gaps. You are a leading voice in the efforts to close the digital divide, but the, in, and, but the inequity is still evident. Mayor Scott pledged $35 million to close the digital divide and named neighborhoods here in West Baltimore that receive hotspots. Many of our students and neighborhoods continue to experience lapses in access. These challenges eliminate the legacy of racism and classism in Baltimore City. What can immediately be done to ensure access to all? Yeah, so first off, thank you for the question, Prisma. Um, so for those that are not familiar, the digital divide is the divide between folks who have internet access and those that don't. And we know that in the 21st century economy, uh, even during this pandemic, our entire education system, folks needed the internet. Um, we needed the internet to get kids online to learn. And so this became a real, the, the fact that Baltimore has this massive gulf between people that have access and people that don't was a huge problem, but during the pandemic became an absolute crisis because we saw kids unable to learn in school. We saw our seniors unable to connect as they were isolated. And we saw entire populations of people that had just been left off the digital map while many of us were able to get online and surf the internet. This has been a long-standing challenge in Baltimore City. Um, it is not new. There was a report commissioned by the ABLE Foundation in 2018 that found, um, my numbers here wrong, 40% of folks like access to internet in our city, which is a huge amount of people, right? I mean, we're, we're this is not 1998, this is 2018 and almost half our city isn't online and when you look at the map of who has been digitally redlined it tracks very closely with the map of who what parts of our city were actually redlined in the 1940s and 50s and so it really is a civil rights issue it really is an access issue it's an economic issue it's an education issue and I'm really 
glad that Mayor Scott, our city council, um, has really tackled this and taken it on. Uh, the mayor set up the Office of Digital Equity led by Jason Hardebeck. That is an important step in the right direction. He is really focused on building both sort of hubs around here in West Baltimore and then really thinking deep about municipal broadband and what it would mean for the city to support internet access for folks. And so right now, in terms of what can immediately be done, what I would say is to plug in with the, there's a lot of digital advocacy happening. Um, the Baltimore uh, Equi Digital Equity Coalition is one group that I think is phenomenal. I would say for all the students, if this is a topic that you're fired up about, get involved with them. They're really pushing in a healthy direction. And I would say that in the next couple of years, this is a real make or break moment for Baltimore where we got to start laying down the fiber and we got to make sure that the folks who do the work are Baltimoreans and that we're supporting our own workforce and not outsourcing those jobs as well. So that's what I would say right now is get involved with BDEC, they're pushing a good agenda and make it happen. <laughs> Serena, yes. hold on one second. Um, thank you so much for that response. I just want to ask Dr. Gilliam because part of the question was certainly about students and their experiences. And, and of course, since we've returned to campus, we have seen and felt the challenges of that digital divide. Um, so Dr. Gilliam, did you want to offer anything? I guess one of the, the comments or thoughts is where do college students fit in this? Because we did experience, as a result of COVID, the number of students that don't have digital access, whether it's um, working internet or the expense of buying extra technology in order to access classes. Um, and, and I think in particular, when we talk about students of color, students at HBCUs, like the disparities and why, talk about the HBCU lawsuit, and again, the students who are most disenfranchised tend to be our students. So where do college students fit in? You know, there's a lot of talk about K-12 education, but there's also a lot of college students in the city of Baltimore that constantly get overlooked in this process. Yeah, no, that's a great point, uh, Dr. Gilliam. And, and I do notice that we've got this hybrid going on right now, which is really neat. Um, I want to say that. Yeah. And most um, of them depend on phones to do everything, which is not yeah. adequate to take a class. Right. Right, right, right. No, and I think that's a really important part of the conversation. I do think making sure our colleges, whether it's Coppin, Morgan, UB, Hopkins, that there's some real power here and pushing in and leaning into the conversation and you all making sure that you're at the table as we think about um, bridging the gap and closing the digital divide, I think it's hugely important. And I do know that I think Coppin has been engaged in some of the work um, with the Mayor's Office of Digital Equity, um, but I think it's a great point. We want to make sure our college students are able to access the, the, the technology and able to learn as everyone else should. And I think that you all have a unique power base right here to really push and help us get to the right direction. Thanks. Council President, did you want to jump in on that? Sure, I'll just add a little bit. Um, my background is in electrical engineering. Uh, I used to literally build uh, data centers. And I think the one thing that is always missing from the discussion is not just the digital divide, but it's also digital equity, mm -hmm. right? Um, to your point of, you know, students attempting to uh, look at, perform, execute work on their cell phone as opposed to an actual computer, which was an intended for one. Um, as we go into 5G, as it relates to speeds, you know, what are we putting in our communities? Uh, so one thing that I constantly try to challenge government on is not utilizing equity as a noun, but more as a verb. And how does that look and how does that feel? So it's not just lighting up communities and neighborhoods, but it's providing them the same equal access uh, to their counterparts and their peers to ensure that from an upward mobility they have every equal uh, right and access to do so and do the same. And I think that that is what's really needed and what's really important in this discussion that we don't hear a lot um, when we talk about developing these plans and developing this access. Thank you. Okay, this next question is directed to both 
Council President Nick Mosby and Council Disease Holmes. Okay. Um, there is a nationwide housing crisis, and we see evidence of this here in Baltimore City. Last summer, the Census Bureau reported that for the first time in over a century, Baltimore City's population dropped to under 600,000. What do you believe has contributed to this to the, this decline? In response, Mayor Scott uh, proposed uh, the growth the growth plan plan for 2030. What efforts has been made to uh, support the growth plan? Um, there's another. There's a number of things that um, have contributed to the decline. Um, you know, Baltimore is the poster child for uh, redlining. Uh, in 1911, it's the Baltimore City Council, uh, the same institution that Zeke and I represent, that passed the first ordinance in the entire United States, not in Texas, not in Florida, not in Alabama, not in Mississippi, but right here in the city of Baltimore, um, that basically told black folks where they could live and told white folks where they could live, right? Told black, well, really, told black folks where they could not live and where they could not buy. Uh, we understand and know that policy regurgitated, went down from Baltimore to, to uh, Louisville to other places spread throughout the country that ultimately gave um, the wise folks in Washington, D.C. this idea of developing a program to create the Red Line Map. Uh, and when we look at all of the socioeconomic declines, not just here in Baltimore City, but in every urban area throughout the country, uh, we understand and know the residual effects of that and we're still playing here today. Um, so when we talk about growth, what does growth look like? In a place like Baltimore, growth, uh, when we talk about it, uh, we're talking about sheer numbers. So we're talking about 600,000. What we don't talk about is the loss of black folks in the city of Baltimore, particularly the black middle class and what is happening to our black middle class neighborhoods. Then when we talk about the areas that have seen a completely disproportionate amount of, of disinvestment from the city of Baltimore, from the state of Maryland, from the federal government in poor black and brown communities, the numbers of, of folks and loss of population is even more astonishing, right? So it's not just about loss, right? But And it's not just about growth. It's about how do we responsibly grow our city? And I think as an elected official that we have to go after responsibly grow our city with the folks that have been dealing with the crime, the blight, and the grind in their communities and in their neighborhoods. So how do we develop programs to keep folks in their place? Now, when we look at a place like West Baltimore, you know, we have residents that are paying $1,000, $1,100, $1,200, a month in rent all around this neighborhood right here, right? We also understand and know that there's developers, there's speculators and folks that come from outside of our city that purchase these same exact properties from the city of Baltimore and, and, and have mortgages that are amortized over 30 years for 700, 800, and 900 while they're paying folks 1,000, 1,100, and 1,200 to live in the same community. You know, I think that we have to have a real push to develop a pipeline of access for home ownership for folks from our communities. You know, one, they're already culturally connected to these communities. They care about the communities. They love the communities. Why not allow us to responsibly grow the communities with folks who are already there? This idea when the city of Baltimore, the housing departments put in, puts in a medium income in a certain area or medium wholesale price in a certain area, we know that those numbers are skewed. But if you're from those communities, you know that there's folks who are teachers, you know there's folks who work uh, in the correction system, you know there's folks that work for the city of Baltimore that can afford mortgages that should or, or work at Coppin who can afford a mortgage and should be the main folks that we're investing in to live in that community. So right now in the city council, we have a proposal called House Baltimore, uh, where we're telling the city of Baltimore, we want all of the residential property that you have access to, you have the authority to sell to put that into a registry and only allow folks that meet certain eligibility requirements to have access to purchase those properties for a dollar. Not only do we want them to purchase the properties for a dollar, but we want the city of Baltimore to put money into the properties to ensure that there's equity in those properties, upwards of $50,000 per property. Um, now this is like unconventional. This is something that we've never done. But again, are we gonna continue to do the same things that we've done over and over again? The only people that are winning with Baltimore's hottest commodity are the speculators and the developers. Baltimore City last year in quarter three had $480 million in real estate transactions. That ranked 20th in the entire country. 20th in the entire country. Now, when you drive through East and West Baltimore, you're gonna see blight, you're gonna see crime, you're gonna see crime, correct? Mm -hmm. But our number one asset is our real estate. Yet we have systematically barred residents of Baltimore City out of it. So again, we have a package on the city council, House Baltimore. 
uh, we're, we want to say, hey, we want to take these properties, we want working class families who are connected to these communities to have access to purchase these properties uh, in communities that they love, and let's responsibly grow the city of Baltimore. Let's just not grow the city of Baltimore. Now, we had a quick vote last week. It was seven to seven. So again, it's still unconventional. It's still a take back. So seven folks on the council agree to do this, and seven folks still have issues with this. But either we're going to continue to regurgitate the same issues, and we're going to see the same level of decline by the same characteristic of folks, and we're going to see certain communities grow while other communities uh, decline and folks buy up those communities, or we're going to take a different approach. I think Baltimore City is in a very unique position to not necessarily be some of the other metropolitan areas that have seen extreme growth over the past 15 years that do not look like the, the folks that have dealt with the issues, the crime, the grind, and the blight. Um, uh, and then lastly, you know, we can talk policy all we want. You know, we talk social policy, we talk, you know, changing this issue, changing this law. That is great and we'll continue to do that. But until we have an economic paradigm shift in our community, we will we'll continue to chase the same issue over and over again for the folks who've been dumped upon for decades upon decades upon decades. I'm saying let's take a different approach Let's develop an economic paradigm shift. Let's develop ways and access for folks to have generational wealth through real estate, which is historically and, 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 and from an empirical perspective, a really solid foundation for folks to build a future on. And it's something that folks have always been barred out of. The reality is we have folks living in Section 8 today. We have folks living in housing projects or, or, or situations today that can trace their lineage and never had access to land ownership. It's astonishing. That's what this is about. So um, again, it's not just about growing the city of Baltimore. What I would say is how do we responsibly grow the city of Baltimore? I ask each and every one of you, look up how's Baltimore. If you are if you live in the city, if you're connected to an elected official from the city, I'll ask you to urge them, what are your concerns? What are your questions about selling houses for a dollar to folks from these communities that have been disproportionately disinvested in uh, and uh, and growing the communities, starting with those individuals. Thank you. Thank you. So the only um, piece in terms of some of the history that I would add is, in addition to everything President Mosby talked about related to our original law, segregating folks and then other cities emulating that and then redlining. We've also had racial housing covenants, barring um, both blacks and Jews and other groups from certain neighborhoods. We were prime victim of subprime lending in the mid late 2000s. So where um, realtors would give out loans that were uh, sounded great, zero dollars down, no payment for the first three, four or five months, but then the interest balloons and what we saw in places like Edmondson Village and across the United States, but hit really hard here in Baltimore was a ton of folks going to foreclosure and a ton of wealth get lost primarily in black neighborhoods, um, as President Mosby suggested. Um, I do think there are some real opportunities and some bright spots that we've seen. Um, I would also encourage folks to look at some of the work that's been done by Rebuild Metro in Johnston Square in Greenmount West, um, really focusing on how do we develop through the lens of community organizing, thinking about those folks in the community who have trust and have built relationships. How do we go block by block by block and bring folks back together? Because what they've shown in those neighborhoods is a decline in vacancies, and then, guess what? You all know the answer to this, but a decline in crime, a decline in all the other things that we don't want to see. Um, so, you know, I think that Baltimore is, as the president suggested, at a cross at a at a cross juncture where I think all of us can either decide: Do we want to be? DC in 15 years, where like the housing market went crazy, and folks who had had homes in Southeast DC either were not able to stay in them, um, folks who were renting got pushed out of the city, or do we want to do it in a way that's, as he said, responsible, and thoughtful, and gradual, and that is able to keep people who have made 
the big investment, put in the sweat equity, put in the their lives, their life's work into our city to retain those residents right here. So can I, can I ask a follow-up question? In addition to um, increasing home ownership, and this is a follow-up question because there's one in the chat. In addition to increasing home ownership, how do we increase development that's responsible development kind of like what you said where we have businesses that are coming back into the community the comment says food deserts i don't subscribe to food deserts i do believe that it is apartheid that it is policy that dictates what grocery stores are in what neighborhoods and it is designed not made by god but made by man so how do we get other development into neighborhoods that we know is vital to a neighborhood's survival in shops, restaurants that are owned by members of the community, that it's not corporations coming from out of the country, out of the state, but how do we develop a neighborhood? And you talked a little bit about community organizing and you touched on some of the other neighborhoods that are doing it. How do we do that for a neighborhood like West Baltimore? Coppin is an anchor institution and we're trying to do it here. We've been here for years, but we have a hard time when we want to go to lunch. You know, there's very few places for us to go to lunch without having to get into a car and drive to go to lunch. Uh, so what are some other things that we can do to attract the types of businesses in addition to homeowners to a community? And what do you recommend for students who are thinking about community organizing? So one thing I would say that I'm really excited about for Coppin, um, I think the president had mentioned it, um, is the West North Ave corridor and the development that's going on there um, with Senator Hayes and Councilman Lee Torrance. Um, I think that's really, really, really exciting just to see that kind of like targeted investment because you're absolutely right, Dr. Gilliam, this is a major asset for our community. And I think we have not always treated Coppin as such. Um, Dr. Buckley and I have had a lot of conversations about why so much energy gets poured into Johns Hopkins or some of the University of Maryland system, or even sometimes Morgan State. Um, but Coppin has not gotten that kind of love. And so I do think that the work that you all are doing, frankly, that you all are leading um, to bring public resources, public dollars, public infrastructure to West North Ave, I think is critically important. And I think that that's, um, that's sort of where it has to start. We have to target, we have to invest, we have to really invest in human capacity, the people that are on the ground, our students, our faculty, um, folks who are in community, who are organizers. To me, that's how we build stronger, safer, healthier communities. That's how we get the grocery store that we all want. That's how we get the parks and all the green space. Um, to me, it really does come through organizing. That's where I've seen it succeed in Baltimore. And I think making sure that policymakers from Baltimore to Annapolis to Washington, DC, are making sure places like North Ave, the communities around Coppin are getting their fair share because the reality is that so many federal dollars, and I say this as someone who represents a community that has benefited from a lot of state and federal support, um, have not gone into West Baltimore, and they should. If we're ever gonna talk about real equity and having a city that is whole, and that's not continuing to hemorrhage residents, I think that kind of movement is critically important, and I'm really glad to see it happening, and proud of you all for leading us and leading it. I'll just I'll just quickly say if, if you told me that there was a community uh, with a four year university uh, with one of the most amazing urban parks in all of America uh, that had uh, extreme amount of accessibility uh, to the mass transit system in the area that had the richness of culture, history, uh, as West Baltimore's area, uh, and you showed me the statistical analysis and conditions of our communities, I would be, again, astonished. And the reason that has become normalized in a place like Baltimore is because simple, it's the privatization of whiteness, right? And until we're, we're comfortable and not using equity, again, as a noun, but more as a verb, right? 
and comfortable of disproportionately investing in communities that have not been invested in for far too long uh, and ensuring that we're not just growing those communities, but we're responsibly growing them, then we're going to constantly have this trick bag of chasing that. So the real question is like, well, how do we have like a, a commercial growth in the community? First is about supporting small and locally owned businesses to come to those communities. Right. It's as simple as that. So um, just for instance, um, there was a new map that came out to, there's a huge tax credit from the state, it's called the Enterprise Zone, right? Uh, and then inside the Enterprise Zone, there's something called the Focus Zone, which is even more subsidies associated to really drive business. So the idea was, you know, we're the poor sections of, 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 of a community. We want to somehow develop areas to bring in commercial entities to help host the communities, to, to become a catalyst to those neighborhoods. Um, well, Target has been sitting empty forever, right? Target was left off that map, right? So I just had one quick question to the Baltimore Development Corporation. And did we think about including Target, West Baltimore? And that's not to say that there's not a lot of great things on that map, but we just need folks to really advocate and pinpoint and identify opportunities. That is a really, really easy opportunity uh, uh, for us to put the community in the best regard. So to your question, it's direct. It's like, do we have the, um, do we have the leadership, the foresight, the energy um, uh, to, 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 to develop programs to, for government to bring private industry inside of communities like West Baltimore? It's as simple as that. It's been done before in other places, and it can happen again right here in the city of Baltimore, uh, but we have to have the collective uh, a passion to do so. Thank you. Council President Mosby, you are the leading voice to pressure Governor Hogan to release the racial and zip code data during the early days of COVID-19. COVID is still very much a public health crisis, but there are other issues that we are grappling with here in Baltimore City, one of which is trash collection. There is an obvious correlation between race, zip codes, and trash collection in our city. Why is trash collection not seen as a public health concern um, by our city leadership? Again, I'm going to utilize the term privatization of whiteness, right? So uh, I would extrapolate that further out than just not trash, but just like environmental justice. Yes. Uh, when we look at the normalization of lead paint in our communities, right? Uh, and the fight that occurs every single day uh, down in Annapolis, the fact that the manufacturers of this lead paint that knowingly targeted places like Baltimore City, it's all through their books, it's all through discovery. Um, that Baltimore City was high on their list of where they were selling it to our housing authority that ultimately painted all up in, uh, a lot of our city-owned build, buildings of the like. Um, you know, and we still never gone after them uh, for for, the, uh, for knowingly uh, uh, putting that in. So I just think when we talk about environmental justice, that's always been an issue uh, in black and brown communities and, and, and socially economically deprived communities. Uh, and I think that uh, trash is just symbolic of it. Um, um, and what, what I say to folks is, um, you know, participating in the political process is one thing to go out and support somebody, but it's another thing to hold folks accountable. And I know I'm not speaking for myself, I'm pretty sure Zeke will say the same thing. You have to hold us and, and all of our colleagues accountable. So when we see that there's a disproportionate amount of, 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 of services that are being provided to certain communities, you are our eyes, you are our ears to, to elevate that, ensure that we're pushing for those services. Uh, the one thing that the city council is there to do is not only, you know, pass policy and legislation, but it's also to be a conduit uh, for um, constituent concern and services. Uh, and um, when we talk about not just trash collection, but we're talking about accessibility to recycling and what are we doing to engage our folks through recycling? Um, you know, when you strip away two a day from trash, right, and you make it one a day, yeah. right, uh, in alleys that already had illegal dumping and already had other issues, again, the disproportionate amount of, of, of disinvestment in those services, you're only going to extrapolate uh, 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 the, the, the issue uh, right there. So um, uh, exponentially. So uh, I think that that's up to us and it's important to have these discussions and be honest about those discussions as we continue to push uh, that narrative forward. But again, what does equity look like? A lot of people are talking about equity. What does that look, what does that even mean? I mean, you can utilize that term and be so ambiguous in the use of it that at the end of the discussion and at the end of your policy, it means absolutely nothing. Uh, so how do we uh, uh, create that into a verb and not just a noun in the city of Baltimore? And I think we've done a really, really good job of utilizing it as a noun and an absolutely horrible job of turning it into a verb and, and through policy and through our actions. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Um, thank you for that answer. I just want to follow up really quickly. And of course, we only have about 10 or 15 minutes um, remaining. But what I heard you say just then, it sounded like we, the constituents, need to do more to hold you all accountable. Well, we pay taxes. And somebody in the chat box um, uh, is asking a question in relation to taxes. It feels exhausting, right? So, like I literally sold my house and bought another house in the city because I was tired of organizing block cleanups and paying high taxes. So I think the question is still there. Like, what can be done? Why do we have to, like, I hate rats. Everybody hates rats, but I'm afraid of them. Like, what can be done? We don't need to cut back on the frequency of this service. We need an increase. We need help, for God's sakes. No, I'm with you. Uh, and I think as elected officials, we just have to, we have to, one, appreciate the fact that you're exhausted, right? And the fact that you're exhausted um, is really a symbolic representation of what the problem is and what the problem intended to do. Um, and then because, also, oh, also oh, because, because folks are not only exhausted, they're frustrated, um, they feel disenfranchised, mm -hmm. um, they feel like being part of it, whether it's going out to vote, whether it's picking up their phone, calling their uh, a, a representative, whether it's being engaged on a city council meeting, they feel like none of that even matters, right? Right. right? And, and, and as elected officials, we have to appreciate that because that is a reality. Um, you know, if, if something, if a system didn't work for your grandfather, and it didn't work for your father. Mm -hmm. How can I report to you that it's going to work for you as long as you do the same thing that they've done? Because they were there, they, they, they voted. They, and this is the issue that we're kind of coming up to. It's, it's, the, it's conflating the, 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 the failed policy, uh, the lack of interest for certain communities to the realities of where we are today. Mm -hmm. And that falls on, on, on the backs of our middle class folks. So again, when we take a step back and we look at the data and we talk about our census, there's a reason that we have a huge decline of middle-class black folks in the city of Baltimore. Because frankly, we have not invested in middle-class black folks in the city of Baltimore for a long time. That's just the reality of it, right? So they said, okay, I can jump across the line. You know, I can pay less in taxes. I can have a, a statistically better school for my child. Uh, I still can entertain myself in the city and participate in the city, but this is where I want to go. So I think that your story is a very uh, a, 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 a consistent story that we hear throughout um, and and as, as elected leaders, we have to continue to kind of push through it and fight through it because we absolutely need you. You know, once we lose the collective organizers in our community that are their block captains, that are the eyes and the ears, it really makes the job of one individual, one representative, extremely taxing and, 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 and hard. So, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you to continue to push through well, and, and you know, work I'm with here. I'm not going to but it's just, it's, it's, it's tedious and it's taxing. And, and then also I think what's important is I recognize my privilege in being able to say, I'm just gonna sell this house and buy another one. What about my neighbors who did not have that opportunity to do so? Yeah. You know, and then they don't have the time and the energy and they, they don't have the ability to reach out to their councilman and say, I need help. Cause you know why they're working two and three jobs. Right. They can't even begin to organize a block cleanup. So it, it, it's it's frustrating to hear that we got to do more when we're doing as much as we can. Well, I, 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 I'm sorry if it came across as you have to do I, more. I, I got what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, I, I, I think I was more or less saying that uh, it doesn't stop by just voting us in, right? But it's also holding us accountable. Yeah. And also, we have the opportunity of participating in the process, participating in the process. For instance, how's Baltimore, the Dollar House program? Um, you know, I think that is a program that if folks really sat down and looked at what we're trying to do in a pilot form, it's just for 24 months. It's very unconventional, but it's something we've never done in the city of Baltimore. If you tell me over the past 24 months who purchased most of these properties from the city of Baltimore, they're not going to look like you and I. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to representative of, of, of individual government names. They're going to be from corporations. They're going to be from nonprofits in the name of affordable housing in our communities. Right. So, OK, this is an unconventional program, but. You know, can can the folks get a mortgage? OK, the mortgage will determine that. Uh, will the properties be undervalued? Well, you know, mortgage uh, uh, banks normally don't invest in properties that are undervalued. Well, will they be able to navigate the program? Our people are intelligent. They're smart. They, we have working class folks in these communities that connect to these communities. We always come up with these excuses when it's time to develop programs for regular individuals who want to give back, who want to be part of their communities. But we, and we somehow do not have an answer for the fact of who have we been disposing property to in the city of Baltimore. 
that sits at the core of what we're talking about when we talk about economic apartheid in the city of Baltimore. So it's not saying that you need to do more. It's just saying, you know, I think that there's opportunities for us to collectively come together and really try to develop paradigm shifts as it relates to the viewpoint of policy and turning this idea of equity from a noun to equity as a real verb. And I, I just want to add to and I think it's important bringing it back to the students and really getting them engaged in this process sooner and earlier, because most of us don't learn any of this until you're ready to buy a house. Mm -hmm. All of the steps that you have to go through, you don't come from a family where this is the norm. Right. So really trying to engage the students. We do an exercise in the policy class where students have to figure out who their representatives are. To me, it is one of the most comical assignments that we have because you would be surprised at how difficult it is for most of us to figure out students who live in the county will oftentimes think that Brandon Scott is their mayor mm -hmm. because it's not that easy of a process to figure out who your representatives are, but it's our first dialogue to really start thinking about who their representatives are, how to reach them, can they reach them, can they write a letter, can they send an email, should they, shouldn't they, can they go down to City Hall? So I also think starting these dialogues with the college level students and doing what you're doing today is important so that students know that they can start doing this process now. Like they're voters now. They're not voters when they're 40 or 50. They can start now and, and starting the process so that when they actually really need to do it, um, they know exactly what it is to do. And they can start doing it now because again, we start talking about student loans. We didn't even get to talk about our student loan debt and all of the other things that students are paying taxes for that they don't even get any of the benefit of. Um, so I know Dr. Buckley, are you wrapping us up? Yes. Uh, well, we have one more question and then Kia is going to ask a student question. Okay, for us. perfect. Okay, we have about five more minutes. Um, this question is for City Councilman Cohen. You have often spoken of the history of racism in Baltimore City that has that has been caused by city leaders. Tell us how the Elijah Cummings Healing City Act has begun the work of accounting for trauma caused by racism in the city and what and what needs to be done going forward. Yeah, thank you for that question. And you know, in addition to everything we've already talked about as it relates to housing policy, we see um, racist policies play out in a whole bunch of other fields as well, one of which being the criminal justice system. So we know that under a previous administration, we locked up over 100,000 of our own people in this city, many of them for nonviolent drug-related crimes. And we know that when we think about the war on drugs, that effectively it became a war on black and brown communities. When I was at Goucher in 2004 to 2008, guess what? People used drugs. And yet, very, very few people were arrested, were harassed. Um, it was normalized on that college campus. When I went and taught in Sandtown, Winchester, um, not too far down from here, Pennsylvania, off of Pennsylvania and North Ave, I would see 13, 14 year old kids leave school and get chucked up against the wall by police officers, have their bags searched, um, often having nothing on them. But there was this war going on, which was supposed to be about stop somehow stopping drug use, which we actually know is a disease related to addiction and mental health disorder. And yet the way we chose to try to solve it was to incarcerate and lock up all these people. One of the things that the Elijah Cummings Healing City Act does is we are retraining every city agency to behave in a fundamentally different way for the people that we serve. And so that starts with understanding what trauma looks like, understanding the neurological components, what it does to your brain, understanding how to identify it when someone walks into your rec center or your library or our school and being able to ask thoughtful questions, teaching folks in city government how to do restorative practices, how to do mindfulness, how to take care of ourselves in a very different way. And so the way we treat those that we serve needs to shift from being punitive first to being healing and restorative. The other thing that the legislation does is cause each agency 
to look back at its own policies and procedures in partnership with our task force and identify ways that we, government, have contributed to re-traumatization of people. So, give you a quick example. First agency we started with is the Enoch Pratt Free Library System. If you all do not have a library card, you should. It is a wonderful, wonderful library system that we've got here in the city of Baltimore. Um, however, like most of our city, Enoch Pratt, up until not too long ago, had a zero tolerance policy. So anyone who was suspected of uh, having drunk alcohol, having used drugs, um, would immediately be written up and thrown out of the library. Which again, we know in the year 2022 that addiction is a disease, is not a moral failing, and to throw someone out, to essentially throw them back onto the streets is re-traumatizing and just doesn't work. You're not gonna help them and you're not really helping us as a community because in addition to mass incarcerating everyone, we're still losing about a thousand people a year to overdose deaths. It's the crisis that we often don't talk about in this city. We talk a lot about the murder rate, but we lose almost three times as many of our neighbors to overdose as we do to homicide. So we, as the task force, met with the head of the library system um, and director Heidi Daniels took a really bold step and decided to, one, get rid of their zero tolerance policy, acknowledging that it was a vestige of a racist, inappropriate, and just wrong-headed approach to curbing drug use, and instead has brought peer recovery coaches into the libraries, starting right down the block on the Penn North branch. And the idea is we're meeting people where they are. We're taking a harm reduction approach to what we know to be a disease. So we've got folks who have themselves experienced addiction, been through it, know what it feels like, know what it feels to be stigmatized um, because of the disease, who are then supporting other people. Just last week, as part of the Healing City Summit, they did a wonderful Narcan training right there at the library, um, teaching some of us and teaching the community how to administer Narcan, which can help save a life if someone is in the process of overdosing. But that's just one example of where we want to see agencies in collaboration with our task force take ownership over their own patterns and practices and change and put in place systems that actually support people instead of criminalizing a disease. All right, so we are definitely coming on down to the end. Thank you to those of you who are still online with us. Um, we're going to have Shankia to pose one of the student questions. Um, there are some really, really, really great questions in the chat box, but we simply do not have time, but I want to bring attention to them. Um, so someone, Brenda, said to follow up on Mr. Mosby, as a citizen that lives in a historically black neighborhood in West Baltimore, what can be done to increase wealth, decrease food deserts, generate income for her neighborhood? She sees her neighborhood as transitioning and she is a member of her community association. Um, um, Emmanuel says, can you shed light on why water bills are so high in Baltimore City? I pay less than $30 for three months in, in Baltimore County. Wow. I have a prop property in the city, currently unoccupied, but pays $39 per month. My understanding is that the water for Baltimore City come from the county comes from the city. Um, somebody else says, is the best way to hold a representative accountable by obtaining a petition with many people and presenting that to the rep? I, for that one, I'm just going to say, I think that depends on your rep. I was I had Zeke as my former representative, and my current rep is Odeth Ramos. Um, you don't need a petition to get through to these people. So, but if your representative only responds to a petition, you need to vote that person out anyway. Um, the last question here is: Statistics show that it takes twenty thousand to forty thousand to house an inmate. To educate a K through twelve person costs twelve thousand on average. We need to flip the funding so that our communities can operate, I'm sorry, so that our communities can compete 
and ultimately allow our country to com compete on a global level? Uh, these are some really thoughtful questions, um, and I know um, that if we had time that you guys would give us some, some knowledge and give us some, some keys to work with. But I think it's really important because we believe in empowering our scholars. It's important that we do um, create the time to hear a student question, and then we'll have our closing remarks. Um, so, thank you. Good day, guys. Um, I would like to thank you guys for coming out again. Um, not only um, as a student of Captain, but I'm also a homeowner of Baltimore City as well. So one question that will not only benefit me, but benefit um, not just my communities, but communities as well. Um, I'm curious about how can we hold businesses physically responsible for our communities? I noticed that we have businesses that benefit from our limited resources, but they do not contribute back to our communities. So what, what can be done about that? <laughs> uh, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I think ha having a business and operating a business in a community is almost a privilege of law for that particular area. That's why you have zoning laws. That's why you have certain requirements of how the business should function and operate. And I think just like everything else, there's become a normalization of of just sheerly the lack of upkeep of businesses in our communities. Um, you know, particularly when we, when we drive around East and West Baltimore and we see our alcohol establishments uh, and the conditions that they're in, um, and we see other establishments and the conditions that they're in. Uh, I think that um, it goes hand in hand with disproportionate, disproportionate amount of disinvestment when we talk about city services. Uh, so when we talk about um, siting these businesses, um, I would equate that to the same way of, you know, the lack of attentiveness to citing, say, a vacant property, right, for not being in the condition it should be in. So I think that we have to do a much better job, again, of providing those services through equity, right? Um, I think there's also opportunities through zoning uh, that we can hold many of our businesses uh, accountable that we have not done to date. Um, before I left the city council and moved to Annapolis, um, I actually had uh, some legislation to look at it from a zoning perspective. We look forward to kind of bringing that back up and, and kind of pushing that. But I think that solely falls on government. Uh, and, you know, what are we doing to ensure uh, that these establishments are operating in our communities, uh, in all communities, uh, as a productive benefit to the community and not as an eyesore or unproductive uh, participant in some of the illegal activity that's participating in those neighborhoods. Yeah, and thank you for the question. Um, I would only add a few things. One is, as residents, our power of the dollar can go a long way. So choosing where we, um, if you have transportation access, Choosing where to shop and not patronizing businesses that cause blight and chaos in our communities, I think is really important. And then I would also say that, you know, I do think it is really important for us as elected officials to be aggressive in pushing those businesses that cause harm in our neighborhoods to not continue to do that. We know that we have a long history in Baltimore I mentioned subprime lending, and we had a, one bank in particular, we had several banks, but one in particular that was literally sending um, realtors into black churches. There's a whole Baltimore Sun article about this, um, and selling predatory, jacked up, terrible loans to people. Uh, that is unacceptable. And to her credit, the former mayor sued that bank and did recoup some settlement. One thing that we saw in the previous city council, um, we know, and I used to teach down there, that in Curtis Bay, there's an incinerator, and they, it has caused disproportionate health, poor health outcomes for that neighborhood. We see high rates of cancer. We see all kinds of lung disease and issues. And I remember when I taught there, just seeing entire families that were sick and knowing that that facility where we incinerate trash contributes to people's illness right there in that neighborhood. To me, there is no greater example of environmental injustice, environmental racism, than having a big 
massive incinerator in a disinvested, low-income, formerly industrial community. It has caused genuine generational harm. What we tried to do in the last council is we passed a law that lowered the, um, the standard for emissions. And so essentially we were trying to get uh, that facility to either clean itself up or get out. They then sued us and we are still in that lawsuit. But I think it's really important, whether it's from a zoning perspective, whether it's legislation, that when we identify businesses that are causing disproportionate harm and are extracting resources out of our neighborhoods, out of our communities, often that don't live here, that live some other place, that we have to be aggressive and we have to work in partnership with community to send the message that we will not tolerate that because that has been unfortunately part of our legacy in this, in this city is too often folks that do not have the best interests of Baltimore take advantage and we got to push back. That's a great question. So in closing to my question, I'm sorry, um, on a more smaller scale um, and thought I was thinking about how can these businesses give back to the community? So not in such as um, an idea of them like having whatever, I'm not sure how to say it, but how can we get them to give back to the community, give back to the kids? So in thought I'm thinking about like when we have community service um, events, maybe they can, maybe it should be required for them to donate back in such a way to, I don't know, I guess to let the community know like, like they're investing in yes. no, yeah. I should, yeah, No, I think that's really, really important. And I think that being a good corporate citizen and being a good partner to community is critically important for businesses. Um, one thing that folks can do is hire young people. We have a program called YouthWorks. It's run out of the Mayor's Office of Employment and Development. Um, it's actually really successful. We employ thousands of kids each summer. Uh, it, it's really, I mean, we don't talk about it enough, but it's a national model. Other cities have emulated it, but there's no earthly reason why businesses can't participate or just hire young people from the community without youth works, right? So I would say that both in terms of what you're talking about with community give backs, and I know a lot of businesses will do back to school, backpack give outs and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's great. I think that's important, but I also think that if you're really gonna be about Baltimore, then hire from within our city and not just at the like basic most um, minimum wage level, but invest in people, train someone up, teach them how to do, teach them the skills, contribute to their ongoing education and have them become part of not only our economy, but your workforce. There's like a whole win-win when businesses contribute in a meaningful way and when they hire from within and when they support us as a city, that not only do we benefit, but they do as well. And I want to see a lot more of that. Thank you, guys. All right. So I, again, just want to express deep gratitude to the both of you for taking the time out. And I want folks who are not here with us in person to know this. Like, this is not their first time coming here. These two gentlemen are, are as Dr. Jenkins said earlier, like, these are people who... Their actions go in line with the words that they speak. Um, uh, when we were just transitioning into the virtual space, Council President Mosby, he wasn't the president at that time, but he did join us um, in one of our classes to talk about COVID. And at that time, that's when we were all locked up in our homes. We were all afraid. We didn't know what to expect. And I want to thank you for coming that time and helping us to frame our conversation around COVID. It's been quite interesting to see the evolution of policies and things of that nature. But trust me when I tell you that in our policy classes, we have made consistent reference to the, um, to the efforts that you made to ensure that our state and the nation understood the relevance and the implications of race and zip code with respect to COVID. And Zeke, you already know um, that we appreciate your partnership and your um, your advocacy. His mom is a social worker, so, you know, I mean, he gets it honest. Um, but we just really and truly value your partnership and your commitment to this work. I heard a couple of words spoken today. 
reset, strategize, critical thinking, partnership, move forward, pay back. Um, Dr. Jenkins encouraged our scholars to stay in social work or possibly consider politics or even open your own company. I want to let you guys know, well, our scholars know, but for those that are not social workers, I need you all to know that social workers are in policy. We are on Capitol Hill. We are in Annapolis. We are business owners. We are in every facet of life. And so that is why the charge for this year's National Social Work Month, the time is now, is so profound. We already know that the time is now because we've been doing this work, but we are prepared. We are ready. We want to, um, to activate with others to move the needle forward. We want to heal from trauma. We want to eradicate harmful policies, and we want to do that collectively. We want to do that together. So thank you all so very much. Also, I want to say you may have noticed that the questions that we asked were not about crime and violence. That was intentional. The problem when people talk about Baltimore City, they want to pathologize Baltimore City. They only want to talk about the blight. But we know because we are, we live here, this is our home, we know that there is more to talk about. Um, and there are other areas that we need to invest our energies into as well. So it's not that we are tone deaf to the issues, but we just know that there are other things that need our attention as well. And so Council President Mosby, Councilman Cohen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You missed your introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you for the appreciation. I want to take a picture of you guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.